money for success. So before we would be able to cover exactly what that would be, you'd have to have some idea of what success meant and what would be an incorrect viewpoint. Because most people who are in the real estate business have an incorrect viewpoint for success. And the proof of that is, by actual numbers, 13 out of 14 people that enter the real estate business at the end of the second year are gone. If you think that number is an exaggeration, look at the number of new licensees coming through the real estate department and notice that the number of agents is not skyrocketing. You understand? <laughs> if we lost half the people in the business, we wouldn't be losing much. It's kind of interesting. What makes it fantastic is that it is not a difficult business. It's so simple, you're going to want to remember this line, it's so simple, a realtor could do it. <laughs> so what causes such a drastic rate of failure? Any guesses? None? Is there some? Yeah. Lack of knowledge. Say it louder. Lack of knowledge. Yeah. No. Lack of no, motivation. Mess up. There's people in the business that are morons. Successful. Yeah, but it's not lack of knowledge. No, it's not laziness. No. Like of all the things you need to be able to do to survive in the business, there's one that's more important than all the rest of them combined. Fake action. Say it again. Fake action. Yeah, but that's got a certain generality to it. See, if we say, what does success mean? It means you decided to do something and then did it. Yes. Or decided not to do it and didn't do it. It's that simple. So in order for something to be even called a goal, you'd have to be able to check it off as a done. If you couldn't check it off as a done, it's so poorly worded, you're guaranteed failure. A goal like, I want to be successful. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Seriously. Nothing. At what? Right. And how would you know if you were? Mm -hmm. If you made the goal money, whatever amount of money, that you're sitting here right now thinking, well, if I had that much, that'd really be something. No, it wouldn't if you had it. It wouldn't. I swear to God it won't. You understand? You go, well, if I had a million, trust me. You get a million, you'll go, this isn't shit. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. So there, there actually isn't a number. The only numbers that impress you are the ones you're like looking up at. You follow. The skill that you have to master, see, your broker will tell them, let me do this part, I've done it before. <laughs> I swear to God, I, I love you. But your guesses but aren't, got, they're not right. They're wrong guesses. But they're, they're wrong guesses. That's the problem. The one skill that is more important than all the other skills combined for success, and it's not figuring out how to do a Bimser response. See the broker, you have to do that. Yeah, you sort of do, but that's not, you, you can find people that are fantastic on Bimser responses, but they couldn't make a living selling houses. You understand? The skill is lead generation. The skill is lead generation. Not a skill, the skill. Not lead conversion. That's a companion skill that goes with it. But if you're good enough at lead generation, you could be crappy at lead conversion and still make a good living. Even if you don't close. Say it again. Even if you don't close. Yeah. Well, skip closing. Your way here. Here's the thing. <laughs> I want you to follow this. Closing, you're talking about closing the deal? Yes. Yeah, skip it. Okay. Skip it, seriously. <laughs> Take all that shit and just skip it. The idea, oh, I'm a good closer. Somebody call, I wake up people. You'd want to hire me because I'm a good closer. No, I don't. I don't want a good closer. First of all, my listing says if you're not happy, fire me. Why would I want someone to close the seller? You understand? 
Like somebody who has the delusion that this business is about talking people into something. Really? You must be amazing. They didn't want to buy a house, but you convinced them to buy one. <laughs> That's awesome. They didn't want to live in Phoenix, but you told them you have to. I'm going to use a technique on you folks. You're going to live here. <laughs> That's horseshit. Lead generation. Finding people who want to buy or sell a house. And you could call those leads. So we could go, I have an email address from someone from Realtor.com but no phone number. Is that a lead? No. They've defined it as one, but it's kind of a horseshit. Here, here's an email address. Email them and see if they'll ever call, write you back. Fantastic lead. <laughs> really, work on it. <laughs> you're, you're with me here. So lead generation's the deal. But what would it mean to have a successful viewpoint? That's what this whole talk's about. Well, what would it mean to have a failure viewpoint? Most agents have one, so this won't be hard to find examples of. Did you ever hear someone explain to you how Zillow's gonna put you out of business? You heard shit like that? That's a failure viewpoint. They're going, there's something so ominous coming from Zillow. They're so incredible that if they fart the wrong way, you're fucked. <laughs> it's a nice viewpoint. That's really because if you can embrace that, because if that one won't drive you out of the business, you'll find others that will. You understand what I'm saying? All you have to have to fail right out of the business is be in agreement that there's something external to yourself that could cause you to fail. Get that? Because there's stuff you don't control. You don't control interest rates. You don't control prices. You don't control net in migration. You don't control the housing supply. A lot of stuff. You, you're not in any way, shape, or form controlling it. Do any of those things mean you're going to be successful or fail? No. There's a shortage of inventory, or, or isn't one. Does that mean, is that good or bad? Seriously, is it good or bad? Well, you ought to know it in any given, you're in a neighborhood. Is there a shortage of inventory or an overabundance of inventory? That'll certainly affect the prices. That'll certainly affect where you need to price the house or what you would tell your buyer to offer for the house. But do any of those things control whether you succeed or fail? Nope. What controls almost exclusively whether you succeed or fail is your attitude about it. That makes sense. Can you or could a person control their own attitude? Yeah. I think so. See, if you have the viewpoint, well, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too short, I'm too tall. You've just got a decision there that you can hang on to that's a justification and an excuse for failure. Does that make sense? And if you're hoping to fail, those work. They're delightful. <laughs> Embrace them. Convince others of them. <laughs> Share the good news. <laughs> Am I making sense? Yes. yes. To succeed at anything, you'd first have to have the idea that it was a goal you wanted and didn't have yet and it was important enough to move in that direction to get it. Does that make sense? What is actually required to be successful as a buyer agent? Start with that. A buyer agent. Say it again. To get buyers. To get buyers. That's correct. What you said, I couldn't hear. Buyers. You have to have, you'd have to have them. Yeah. But what else do you have to have? See, here's the deal. Do you have to know a lot of stuff to succeed as a buyer agent? No. 
If, the, if you did, nobody could ever do it. It starts in the business. And yet people who graduate from real estate school, who have learned almost nothing <laughs> that matters, the only thing I learned in real estate school that I actually still use today, an acre is 43,560 square feet. That's it. That's the end of that list. <laughs> Nothing else. I don't use any. All that stuff about, you know, if you do this, you, the commissioner will take your license. If you do that, the commissioner will take your license. You know the other stuff. Here's a little more list of you need to read up on other things. The commissioner will just shove it right up your ass. <laughs> They're not taking your crap. Isn't that what they teach? Yes. yes. Do you use any of it? No. no. Were you going to break any of those rules? No. Were you going to commingle? You know what? You understand what I'm saying? Most of the stuff is the commissioner is not going to take your crap. They're just, she's not. Judy hates your guts. You know this? She's seen pictures of you and she's just. <laughs> but you understand? This is what they teach. Now, what do all of the instructors who teach pre licensing have in common? Say it again. They used to be real estate. They, they never did it successfully. <laughs> that would be the thing. So all of the stuff they have to tell you that you ought to be doing, it's nice because it's bundled with a nice failure viewpoint. And they're standing there in front of the room with altitude, because they know all this stuff you don't know, and they're explaining the rules. They're very serious rules, too. Very grim. So you learn this shit, and then you get you pass the license. You, you, you're, you're a realtor. If you have a lockbox key, a car, access to the MLS, and don't smell bad, <laughs> you are qualified to show people houses. And I'm not making a joke. If you have to have some idea of how to get from one house to another, but you don't actually have to know a lot of stuff about the houses because they don't even expect you to anyway. <laughs> I'm not kidding. But you go, you open the door and they walk in. Nobody's gonna go, well, do you think this is block construction? What do you, are you, what do you, you could, it wouldn't matter what they asked you if you just said something catchy like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. My husband might, but I don't know. <laughs> it won't matter what you say, just don't piss them off. Because they're not really looking to you for, I hope you can explain to me the nuances of the footing in this house. <laughs> They're not really gonna, if they say it, it's got a horseshit quality to it. And there's like, they think of shit to say so they can talk to you about, but the truth is it won't matter. And there's nothing they could ask you, you couldn't say, damn, I don't know, I'll have to check. That's true. And they won't be mad at you. And it's time to fill out the contract. If you go, I, that's the first time I've done this, I'm just gonna make sure I get everything right so it's gonna take me a while. They won't care. No first time buyers going, we were hoping for someone that could do it fast. <laughs> we wanted someone who could speed right through it. I, no, I don't want you to take too long. It won't matter what you don't know. It really won't. And when you approach a buyer and you start telling them all the stuff you'll do for them, and I remember, no charge to them. Why wouldn't they be happy with the service? You understand what I'm saying? What's for them not to like? They don't even have to pay you. And you'll do all this stuff for them. That's really important stuff. You may think if you're new, you don't know that much. Well, you know more than they do. Seriously, you know more than they do. It works, that'd be enough. Now, if you're gonna take listings that don't fall in your lap, so if you sell the house to the guy and he says, crap, I have one I have to sell. I'll do it, okay. Is that a listing presentation? No, no but could you get a listing that way? Yeah. Hey, you know, my brother needs to sell his house. Could you talk to him? Sure. 
When you're new, that's how you get a point. That's how you get listings. Does it work? Yeah, works just great. Now, could you expand that way? No. No. But can you get started that way and learn quite a bit and earn quite a bit? Yes. But so far, is everything making sense? Yes. So what would it mean to have a successful viewpoint? What would that, what's that, what would that be like? This is not a trick question. <laughs> and I don't prepare speeches. If you say to me, what's coming next? I don't know. <laughs> I never know. No one, God would know. God's going to direct me to say something. Say it again. You won't brag for a job. My what? Say you won't brag for a job. You won't brag for a job. Brag for a job? I'm applying for a job. <laughs> ah, I know. Yeah. I like this though. I can guess what you're saying, so and then once I do it, yeah, I like this because I'm hard of hearing anyway. And this makes it even more special. When you say something, you you know what she said? So, what would it mean? I'm trying to loosen up. What would it mean to have a successful viewpoint? Successful. Say it again. That you'd be successful. What would it, good? I like it. Now, right. no, no, I'm not. Yeah. What would it mean to be successful? Talk uh, to me about accomplish it. your goals. Six, let me fin oh, finish my talk. You said it. To, to have a set of goals and to meet or exceed those and. Yeah. Good. And you said to accomplish your goals. What's your goal? <laughs> Whatever you set out. No, 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 no. That's horseshit. What, what's your goal? What's your goal? Personally? Yeah. 36. To do 24 uh, <laughs> deals a, a year. 20, how long have you been in the business? A uh, year and eight months. Okay. So you want to do 24 deals in the next 12, in this 12 month period. Right. In, in 2019, you want to close 24 deals. So you hit 24, <laughs> you accomplished your goal. 24 closed escrows. Is that right? Right. Good. Is that a similar goal to anybody else in the room? You can change the number, but is that a similar goal that you have too? So I'm gonna talk just more about his goal, and if your number's 40 or 10 or whatever, that's fine. We'll just stick with the 24 this year, okay? So if you were gonna have 24 closed deals, what would you guess how many escrows you would need to open to get 24 closed? 30. 30? That would work. Anybody else have a different number? Serious question. Why would 30 in escrow give you 24 closed? Talk to me about that. Say it again. What, what percentage are going to fall out? Ballpark it. Let's go with 10. Let's go with 10%. And you can get this from the title company. Like what percent they have falling out, that's about what yours are gonna be. Now, do you like it when a deal falls out of escrow? Does it make you happy or sad? Sad. Sad. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Take the stuff comes up. I love that. Thank you. So the first thing, no, no, we're just want to come back to this. So the biggest single barrier that you will collide with, and very few people go here. Well, don't work with toxic. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's take it further. If you have a customer that you get a bad vibe from, <coughs> do not sell them a house. Do not sell them a house. If everywhere you go, you feel odd, whoever you're around, you, the problem is with you. <laughs> but if you're normally pretty comfortable in your own skin, and you're in someone's house, and you go, Jesus, God, I know these people are weak. Get the 
fuck out. Just leave. I, I've, had, I've, spoken, I've, I've, I've given talks literally all over the country. Seriously, all over the country. And the question I would get, well, what do you say when you're leaving? What fuck? What does it matter what I say? What the fuck do you care what I say? Leave. Get out. Just leave. Unless you feel that you have this death wish or you did something really rotten last lifetime and you need to make amends for it this lifetime by just taking some shit. And you look at that guy and go, yeah, this guy's a real asshole, but I have it coming. I don't even know what I did. Because you look like, well, you didn't do anything bad this lifetime, but you've done some shit. You must have for that guy to be treating you like this. Now, unless you go, I get a big kick out of being treated like that. There's this special thing you can do. Don't work with people like that. And the thing that I've heard a few thousand times, well, it's real easy for you to say, Russ. It's easy for anyone to say, and when I first said it, I was dead broke, had filed bankruptcy, didn't have shit, period. And that's when I decided, I'm not going to work with people I don't want to work with. Period. And you don't even have to have a reason. You just go, I don't like, I don't like them. Leave. Done. You go, isn't that harsh? No. If your goal is to sell 24 houses closed, you are going to encounter some people that are in, they're not, it's actually their minority, but they're out there and they try to make people's lives miserable that they come into contact with. <coughs> they're not specializing in aggravating realtors. They're just miserable people that want to share their misery. And my answer is, don't do business with them. When you take a listing, or when you have an implied agency relationship with a buyer, even if you don't have a buyer-broker agreement, <coughs> If you were to, if you're on an open house and you say to a buyer, uh, if this one's not what you want, I, I could find you some other stuff that you might like. Mm -hmm. You just started an implied agency relationship, even if you don't write one out. You have a listing, you mm -hmm. definitely have an agency relationship. And that says, I'm gonna put their interests above mine at all times. I'm gonna recommend what's good for them, not what's good for me. Now, if that's true, do you actually wanna be in that position where you're legally sort of forced to help someone you don't even like? A serious question. If you don't want to help them, don't then find someone you do wanna help. You'll be happier all the time. You'll make more money all the time by not attempting to do business and help people you don't really want to help. Does that make sense? Yes. So this came off of your thing. Like, so if you've got this like, oh my God, why would you want to stick yourself with that person? See, a really nice customer, really, a really nice customer, they call you at 10 o'clock Sunday night and they go, I hate to bother you. It's not my pleasure, what do you need? Because you like them. That makes sense. That's your customer base, those people, not the ones you're like, oh crap. Any, is that, any question on that before I move on? Anything. Is it a little too warm there for you, sweetie? Just, yeah. Could someone make, honey, I don't know how to work it, but if you have to break that plastic thing off, I know you do <laughs> it really, really well, and they wouldn't mind if we snap that plastic cover. <laughs> yeah, in fact, they, Mark told me, he said, if you need to break something, <laughs> so, customers you like, so let's go back to, and you need to get more in escrow than you closed, and, and, and it's about 10% or so, so that number 30 works just fine, so you need 30 new escrows to close the 24. Now, do, they, do you think you're going to get them all evenly? Like uh, 2.3 each month. No. <laughs> no. What would be, 
just as a good little bit of data here for you. The lowest quarter of the year for new business in is the fourth quarter. So the lowest quarter for closed business would be first quarter. The biggest quarter for new business is second quarter. So the biggest quarter for closings would be third quarter. Does that make sense? You'll make most of your collected cash in the last six months of the year, specifically in the last three months of the year, so you'll collect most of it. So you want to know these things so that you don't get the money uh, in uh, August and go, oh God, I can't believe how much I just collected. This is my new monthly income. <laughs> I can actually afford now. No, you can't. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. Uh, you'd have to have some idea of how it's going to look for you like that. that. But those are just a few mechanical things. But I still want to stick to, so what would be a correct viewpoint to accomplish any goal? We'll come back to the 24 houses. Close. What would be a correct viewpoint to accomplish a goal? I can do it. Good. You can do it. Well, you got. I want to take that, but you have to work at it. It's got kind of a. Uh, <laughs> see, the correct viewpoint is yes, I can do it. That that that's perfect. How many of you guys know who Roger Bannister was? Nobody. One guy, John. Roger, who just recently passed away. He was a medical doctor. When he was a medical student, he lived in the UK. When he was a medical student, and this is an amazing story. When he was a medical student, he ran every day on his lunch hour, every day on his lunch hour. And Roger became the first person in recorded history to run a mile in under four minutes. He's the one who broke the broke the, broke the limit, but he did the four minute mile. Prior to Roger, it had not been done in recorded history. I don't know what somebody 3,000 years ago in Greece or something, I don't know, but I can tell you, well, I'm serious. I, I don't know how fast somebody back there ran. I was not standing there with a stopwatch. So I don't know, but what I do know is that in recorded history, prior to Roger doing it, no one had ever done it, period. Now, it was a known fact before Roger did it, but it couldn't be done. Well, I want you to get that. It was a known fact, it could not be done. A horse could do it, a man could not do it. Those were facts. Once Roger did it, and he's in the history books, for the, he's the guy who wrote the four minute mile. That's not what's amazing about this story. What's amazing about this story is that in the next 30 days, two other runners did it. In the following 11 months after that, I believe the total number of runners that did it was 19. I want to let that sink in. It had never been done in history. It couldn't be done. It was a known fact it couldn't be done. And Roger did it. So from a marketing perspective, it's obvious, be first. Because if you say, who was second? I don't know, nobody gives a shit. <laughs> who was third? I don't know, I have no idea. Maybe look it up, but I, nobody cares. He, he was first, end of the list, nobody cares. So if you're gonna do anything that amounts to marketing, the book you wanna read is The 22, that's two two, The 22, Immutable Laws of Marketing by Al Rees and Jack Troutton. I believe that's the most important book on marketing that's ever been written. Rule one is be first. If you can't be first, be first in a category. But you're gonna to wanna to study that book if you're gonna spend any money on marketing. What was it again? The 22 Immutable, you can see it on Amazon if you put it in your phone right now. The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. Say it louder. Immutable with an I. Do I? Yes. 
and you she sealed the switch from that If I did anything that you don't like, I'm sorry. I offended you. All of them, all good looking women going, I'll kick your ass. I don't need it. Okay. So I'm just I'm sorry. I take that. Thank you. Yes you do. Huh? Yes. Yes I do. So you can't just find it. You got it. You guys found it that we're looking for. The twenty two immutable laws of marketing. I'll read Jack Brown. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I do want you to have that little tidbit if you're going to be uh, looking for stuff on marketing, that's, <clears throat> start with that. And anything you read where that doesn't make sense, the other book you're reading is horseshit. <laughs> it's simple. Well, I mean that. Though. There are an astounding number of experts on subjects. And there's an amazing amount of false data. If you look at most of the people going around the country teaching agents how to be fantastically successful, it's amazing that they weren't. None of them. The only one that was. There is only one guy teaching, mm -hmm. teaching success, and oddly, what he did to be successful isn't what he's teaching. That'd be Craig Proctor. All of the others were burnouts. All of them. Tell them I said so. <laughs> you want to sue me? Fuck you. I want it. I want it. I'm serious. I, it's sickening to me that you have people going, I'm so fabulously successful, I'll show you how to be fabulous. But they weren't. You get that? There's a company now, and the guy who started it is brilliant. Uh, EXP. Yeah. But what's astounding is the people that join it for the express purpose of, I don't need to sell any real estate. <laughs> I'll just sign people up. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've seen this, I don't know, to me it's humorous. Um, it's got to be serious in here. Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> but you understand, the guys that are going to make money in real estate know how to sell real estate. It's not that hard to do if you're struggling. See, the problem is if you get false data, wrong data, or no data. It, there, but there's tons of misinformation, just tons of it. And so you get people going, well, in order to have success, you have to have a big why. Your reason why. You have to have this big, you ever heard that? Yeah. Really? What if you just wanted the money? Yeah, you can't. That's not a big why. <laughs> I see. So you, you're, if you say, well, I want to do it to help children. Okay, that's good. How about if I just wanted the money so I get laid a lot? Is that No, that's no. You have to have this sort of religious thing. Poor shit. You could have any goal you wanted. And the principles of achieving a goal, whether it was a pro-survival, if you said, my goal is to make her life miserable, my ex-wife. I hope I can just, oh, God, I hate your guts. And I hope, well, there are people, this is, their, this is what they're working on. This is what they're working on. This is where their attention is. Oh, that bitch, she's not getting one more dime from me. No. And this is their goal. Here's the rule. Whatever you keep your attention on is what you're going to get. That's practically a law of the universe. So if your attention's on, oh, I can't have another deal full on escrow, guess what you're getting? <laughs> you understand? Whatever you resist, you get. I want to say that again. Well, I don't want deals falling out of escrow. I got it. It's going to happen. That's negative. No, I'm positive it'll happen. Well, I don't want it. The more you don't want it, the more it's going to happen. You understand? Yeah. So here's something. 90% or more of success in this business is what? It's, it's, it's mental. It's an attitude. It's a viewpoint. If you decide business is easy to get and it's fun, 
Does that make sense? It's just yes. a decision. And you just kept creating. I love new customers and they're, I, I, it's just easy for me to get customers. And just kept creating that. What do you think might be the result of that? Huh? Yeah. And notice it would be sort of a lighthearted, fun thing, <laughs> not this, all right, another customer. <laughs> you understand the difference? So in order to achieve a goal, you have to name it <coughs> on the foreclosed deals. You would have to want it, and that want would have to be unconditional. Any questions? What do you mean unconditional? Say it louder. What do you mean unconditional? So if you have a condition on something, so you could have an unconditional warranty, if this tire blows out for any reason in the next 12 months, we'll replace it. Unconditional warranty. Versus, well, we're not gonna cover against road hazards, nails, uh, this, that, those are conditions. It is a conditional warranty. So if you put conditions on your goal, well, I want the business, but I don't want to work weekends. Okay. All right, you've just, you've just said, I don't totally want that goal. I'm gonna modify the goal. I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna take my goal and I'm gonna start modifying it. As soon as you start modifying it, you've already made a decision I can't have the goal just the way I said it. You could take any goal. So you, you go, well, the guy wants a red Corvette. Well, I don't know if I can get a red one. <laughs> Maybe I can get an old one. If you had wanted a red Corvette, but if you just totally wanted a red Corvette, there's several things that advantage of this example. He'd know whether or not he got one. So up until the point he got it, he would know he still needed to work on getting it. And once he got it, he'd know he could end cycle on that goal. He's got it. This business, see, you say, what drives people out of the business? The deal that fell out of escrow when they thought they had it, they, it was, they were, I had the, everything was that appraisal came in low, and it's not like God damn it, it was so close. That was seven thousand dollars, and then they they would they they can't they wouldn't list with me, and they listed it and they sold it to Zillow. I'm gonna fail. <laughs> Am I making sense? So part of us, I want the goal. Roger wanted the four. He wanted to break the four minute mile. <clears throat> What if it takes longer than you thought it was going to take? It just takes longer. Yeah. Does that mean you failed? No. No, no it doesn't. If you had the correct viewpoint, would it be possible to just not have failure? Yeah. You're saying no. Well, I mean, if you want to call failure something else. No, 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 this isn't a semantics trick. I think we all fail at times. It's a matter of continuing the course, right? Okay, let's take that. Uh, this is important. Did you all hear what she said? And you understand that. And I want you to see, really, because you're, you're bringing up a great point. So if you had a deal fall out of escrow, would it be then correct to say you failed to close that escrow with that customer? Yes. yes. Now, does that make you a failure? No. So let's go back to this man's goal here. 24 closed deals in a year. Does what happens on that escrow have anything directly to do with the goal? Because he has to get 30 into escrow anyway. If he already knows he has to get 30 to hit the goal of 24 close, he already knows he's going to have some fallout. Say it again, sir. In that situation, he can have 50 fall out of escrow as long as he hit his 24. By the end of the year, he's got it. Yeah, Some yeah. Some people will have, they have fought, they have fell at, they have fell at it 50 times, realizing they think they, they did make it and give up. But if you still got 24 closes, you got you it. At 12 there you go. Still can get it done. Yeah. Right. So the real question is, where's your mind when you don't hit 24? Say it louder. Where's your mind when you don't hit 24 at the end of 12 months? Okay, listen, I'm going to come back to that. I want to finish this part up right here. I've got your question, though. If I, if I don't circle right back to it, you, you bring it up again. So I want to make sure we've covered this, though. So are you going to... See, this is the rule is, if you don't want to get hit, don't get in the ring. Right, right. There's no... Like, you go, 
oh God, I just can't stand to have a deal fall out. Then don't get it. Don't, don't. Get a deal. Don't get it. Do something else. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're going to have deals fall out. You're going to go on appointments. You're going to talk to people. You thought, I thought we were friends and he listed it with the other company. I can't believe it. You let that crap get to you. And you start doing soul searching of what's wrong with me that that half, why did he do that? As though it had a damn thing to do with something being wrong with you. Do you hear me? Don't you ever ask yourself that question again or any variation of it. You understand what I just said? Don't ever take that bait there are people you know, you can call them passive, aggressive, covertly hostile, or just pricks. But what am I telling you? There are people you know that when they talk to you, they're, it's like an art form, they introvert you. They get you to take your attention off the world around you and look inside, I wonder what's wrong with me. It's fun, great exercise. And if you were to go sit on a mountaintop for just a few thousand years, here's a newsflash, you'll never get an answer to that question because the correct answer is nothing. Nothing is wrong with you. You don't know what was going through the mind of that other person. Even if they told you, they probably made up a bullshit lie. You think I'm kidding, I am not. People make all of their decisions based on emotion, even if they're electrical engineers. They will pretend to have a logical explanation for the reason they did it. My top lister has been with me 22 years. He has been on, oh, maybe seven, I'd say 9,000 appointments at least. JC has been on at least 9,000 at the table. All problems of getting listings are either at the table or getting to the table. So about, uh, I'd say 12, about 14 years ago, he comes to me and he says, we need to start having open houses. We need to start running an ad in the Arizona Republic. And we need to do something more like Callaway's total marketing package because I've lost two deals this month to Joe and Callaway. I said, interesting. I said, come on and sit down. I said, we're not going to change anything. And he said, why? I said, have you ever met Joanne? He said, no. <laughs> I said, and the guy I'm talking to, what do you think, I'm six one. JC's about six four, six five. Thin, broad shoulders, no hair, like Dustin, cocky too. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I think it just sets the stage for what I'm about to say. <laughs> Joanne, in sharp contrast, looks like she came off a farm in Illinois. Not one of the big cities, but farm country. She was a bum. Yeah, and uh, a frumpy look. Where JC's got monogram shirts, Alan Edmund shoes. I mean, he, 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 I said, anyone who likes how you look and would want to list with you won't list with her. And if they liked her, they don't want you. He said, why would you say that? He said, I said it because it's the truth. You, and you go, what did I do? You didn't do something bad. It's that simple. There's an energy you emanate. I would say personally, I think it's extremely pleasant, but somebody else goes, God, I don't care for her. Awesome, find someone else to sell a house to. It's that simple. So don't ever take the bait on the what's wrong with me. So let's go back to, are you going to deal with customers where you think you're doing everything right? And if I were right, they're going, yeah, yeah, keep, yeah, yeah you're good, keep going. And if you said, oh, they listed with uh, Remax. I'm like, okay, next, that's it. There's nothing else to add. And you say, what did I do wrong? Uh, why did you even ask that question that way? What makes you think you did something wrong? Because if you didn't go, unless you're a 100% people pleaser personality, you go, shit, they didn't seem happy with me. What am I going to do? Continue being you would be the correct answer. You understand? That's it. Yes, sir. When, when things happen to kind of blow your mind, just 
some of the voice decided to get a little late on it and like you said, you know, somebody takes a listing or whatever it may be. Okay, just a little louder. Okay, so when, when you have this little voice inside you sometimes telling you should probably be doing something and you mm -hmm. kind of like, and then, then you find out that somebody you thought was going to listen to you went out and go to something else. And just, do you ever tell your, your agents to call them and find out what you, what you did wrong? No, okay. no. That's what I was curious about that is because I think they're probably going to be saying, well, if you don't know what you did wrong, how could well, there's one thing to call. Here's, here's the thing. Do, I, do we want to find out what they said on why they listened? Yeah. But I don't want to make the assumption my agent did something wrong. That's the same thing I'm telling this lady here. But do you have, I mean, do you, do you have your agents give a call and say, do they want to know what I caused you? No. Well, here's the thing. Move on. It's like, you see, the question, if, if I said, what, what is my job with my agent? Seriously take poison out of their head. Same thing I'm doing here today with you. Take poison out of your head. So some things invite poison. That question, not, not this is not a make that question invites poison. It invites poison on several levels because it starts with the assumption, you're doing something wrong, so you already sort of have the, I'm doing something wrong, I just don't know what it is. Oh, that's nice. So you can kind of walk around all the time with, there's just something not quite right with me. <laughs> that's what you understand. I'm not making fun of you. No, what I'm saying, but calling him doesn't help at all, basically. You just move on. <laughs> well, here we have two things. So all problems, all problems in getting listings are either at the table or getting to the table. There are no other types of problems. So, because you're all with the same company, I can talk about Tim. Are you know everybody here with my home group? Mm -hmm. So I can just blatantly, it's like if I said Commission X, I don't have to go cookies or some horse shit. There's like 6%, 5%, 4%. We can just say it. There's a number that you're not going below. Like if it's below four, fuck them, I'm not taking the listing. There's people out there that'll go below that. I promise you, and you go, are you seriously? And if you have a seller who doesn't want to say, look, I'm just a moron, and I'm just going to find whoever has the lowest price, my answer to those people is if it's going to sell for the same price, no matter who sells it, why don't you just sell it yourself? You'll save all the money. Don't waste any on an agent. See, let's take purple bricks. What can I say about them? They're going to be broke if they keep trying to do business here. That's an emphatic statement. Since they started, they've done about 30 million in volume. And they're running TV ads. I happen to know what TV ads cost. <laughs> <laughs> and I gotta tell you, at those margins, they're fucked. They're just bleeding and they're fucked. And they'll go be back to England where they belong. So let me just start. Yeah, homie, Dane Briggs just left homie. Oh, did he? Yeah, he's gone. He's he's now free free floating or whatever. I can he's, like him again. Huh? You can like him. Again. <laughs> but my point is, Dane, Dane's a good guy. Homie's a piece of shit. Now here's the thing. Homie, with all this fantastic shit, since they started, total gross volume, twenty million. That's nice and stupid. <laughs> they make a lot of noise, but they're not doing any business to amount to anything. And 20 million for them at 1,900 bucks or whatever it is for listing, oh yeah, that's just gonna put them right on easy street. Can I ask something about that? They're going broke. Yeah. Why do you think Dane left? He just couldn't take all the money? <laughs> why did, why did uh, what's his name, Mike Ferry stop selling houses <laughs> Oh, he just couldn't stand it. The income was sickening to him. And he wanted to just share his fucking wisdom with the world. <laughs> <laughs> he lies from the stage. It's horseshit. And the only difference is, I know it because I've been on both sides of this stuff. These guys are, they're just lying sacks of shit. You had a question here. 
Jesus. <laughs> I'm starting to loosen up a little bit. <laughs> I want us to communicate back and forth openly, where I'm not going to hide much of my stuff. Just telling you the truth. I'm so. But I want to take that question that you brought up, the what's wrong with me thing, because that's it's not a good question. So all problems in getting listings are either at the table or getting to the table. Most agents, if you've been on less, here let's make a sweeping statement. You're new, so I know this will hit you right. You have a shitty listing presentation. Yes. Yes, perfect. <laughs> now, am I picking on you? No. If you've been to the table less than 50 times, that's 5 0, you don't have your sea legs, you have a shitty listing presentation. But again, all problems in getting listings are either at the table or getting to the table. Your only issue is getting to the table. You say my presentation's crappy. I know, but let me tell you how you get it to be good. There's just one way. And all the people running around the country saying buy my special fantastic listing presentation are all lying sacks of shit. I mean that in the nicest way. Don't buy any of their crap. There's only one way to get good at taking listings, and I'm going to share it with you. Don't let this out. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. You've got to promise. This is a sacred vow. We're inside the temple. <laughs> Lips sealed. We, think it's, we have this deal. The way you become a competent, good listing agent is you first develop a tolerance for being a crappy listing agent. And I mean that quite literally. If you pretend to yourself that you're already awesome, you're fine. Because now you, you're thinking, I, I'm so, like, there's a guy, he's with EXP, and he closed, this reason I'm telling you, this is just so fantastic. He closed 29 deals last year. On Facebook, he was promoting, I won't say his name, he was promoting that he had spent 20 years becoming the best in the world at what he does. I thought that was impressive. 29 fucking deals and he's the best in the world at what he does. <laughs> then he says, but that's not for him anymore. <laughs> no, he's, he's beyond it. He wants to find 40 people that he can help and mentor. Mentor them with what? Do you think there's a prayer he could teach someone to do 35? He can't take them past his level. You understand? He can't, no one can. See, if you tell me a year from now, my goal is 100 deals. Awesome. Awesome. Do you think I think that's a big number? No. No. So that's the key. If you tell somebody who's never done over 10 deals, I'm going to do 100 deals. How the hell are you going to do that? You won't have any trouble finding someone to make nothing of it for you. I'm going to do 100 deals next year. How the hell are you going to do that? You tell me, go to Brett Tanner. Tell Brett, I'm going to do 100 deals. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Brett won't find it. How the hell would you do it? That's not a big number to Brett. Go out to Chandler. Tell Bill Ryan, I'm going to do 100 deals. Awesome. That's not a big number to Bill. Tell Nate Martinez, Frank Russo. They're not going to go, well, now how in the name of God would you get to 100? Frank did 100. They did 20, 30 years ago. If they're not doing it now, it's because they're doing other shit. But that, that's not a big number. You understand the point I'm getting at? So I lost my train of thought. I got so fascinated with that great example I was giving. And I hope you all liked it. <laughs> and if someone who was really listening can tell me where I was, that's going to look real smart for you. <laughs> you about listening agent, when you think that you, you reached that point where you think you're good. Yeah. He thought he was so amazing, but I thought he's not this nitwit quality. You can't take someone past your own level. Right. It's not going to happen. So the thing that I wanted to keep hammering on, because if I got nothing else done today, get rid of the toxic crap. The way you're going to become a great lister is first become a crappy lister and continue going to the table. 
is like a comedian getting stage time. There's no substitute for it, none. You have to go to the table over and over and over. There's nothing else you can do. Now, if you, what part of town do you live in? Gilbert. Gilbert. So if you don't want to call on your neighbors, go over to Peoria or Glendale and practice on those people. And I'm not kidding. Because if you're over, if you live in, in Gilbert and you're over in Peoria, or you're, yeah, if you're over in Peoria on a listing appointment, you really won't care if you get the listing or not. And that's the right attitude. That, oddly enough, is the correct attitude. Not, oh my God, not what did I do wrong? You have to be willing to have it not matter what you did wrong. You're going to do shit wrong. How good is your presentation? Right now, it's terrible. <laughs> the better it gets, the better you'll do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let me give you one other little piece of data here. You ever hear someone say, they list nine out of 10 appointments they go on. Mm -hmm. it is. It's a fantastic number, I love it. Let me tell you my numbers. They're really shitty compared to that. <laughs> and I'm proud of them, because they're real. In the 15 years prior to the run up in prices, my numbers at the table, and this is where they called me off my ad. This wasn't me cold call. My numbers at the table for 15 consecutive years was between 56 and 58% conversions. Those are real numbers. Anyone claiming closing nine out of 10 can't count. It's that simple. And I won't back down off that. Anyone they want to assert they did it, I go, you're a fucking idiot. Or they're just listing their friends out. Or yeah, if you're going on ten appointments a year and they were but but if you're actually a lister, you're going on appointments. It can't be done. It's not going to be done and don't even work on it. This year, we're finally back in the saddle again. We've listed as of yesterday thirty seven listings so far this month. This is best this is the best I've done in years though. But I got my health back. I got my energy back, I'm rolling. And so this is, to me, I want to get back up to like 70, 80 a month. That's where my, that's where my tension's at. So this to me is a dinky, shitty little number. <laughs> and I'm not kidding, but that's what you have to look at it. If you're impressed, if you go, oh my God, I had 10 listings. If that's a big number, you won't shoot past it. You understand? But if I could accomplish one thing, so I still haven't left that deal of what did I do wrong? You go in there and you give it your best shot. It's just that simple. You go into the appointment and you give it your best shot, whatever you're capable of doing. Now, there are some things you can do, like don't be tired, don't be hungry. <laughs> I'm not making a joke. Like if you look, if you're a parent, You've most certainly had tons of experience with a child where no matter what was wrong, no matter what they were complaining about, feed them, put them to bed, it fixed the problem magically. You know what I'm talking about. But I really, yeah, yeah, I understand, honey. It's okay. Just have something to eat, put it to bed. <laughs> and they're magically fixed. Mag just like magic. They got enough food and enough rest, and all of a sudden, whatever was just making them crazy, it stopped. How many realtors have you ever heard say something like, I didn't have anything to eat today. This is my seventh cup of coffee. Yes. And I'm just waiting to get that dozer back so I could go and sing myself. Because <laughs> I'm right on the fucking edge. And as soon as I get they think they don't like this and they don't like that, I'm gonna blow. <laughs> yeah, that's smart. Where's the donuts? Yeah, you understand? Well rested, well fed. Protein in your system, that kind of stuff. It's like magic. So coming back to, if you went into a listing appointment, caffeinated out the top, and no food, do I think that's a good formula for success? No, I don't. What should you have? I'm not trying to tell you what to eat, just eat something so that you're not, because if, you're, if, you're, if your body is starving, and I'm not making a joke or exaggerating, you'll do and say dumb shit, that's all. So I've just found from tons and tons and tons, like thousands of hours of experiences, if I, my agents, don't go on an appointment when you're starving. 
Like, don't help me by being on some stupid fucking diet. <laughs> when you walk in there and the seller says something, you're like, you can't talk to me that way. Don't do that. Just don't do it. Eat. Sleep. And if you'll do that, then you go in, you're a nice person, seriously. You go on the appointment, and then you give it your best shot. And you either get it or you don't get it. And if you don't get it, you don't then introspect, like, God, I know I must have done something horrible. I don't know. There's, there's a woman, I heard about this, where her all, she, all of her listings, she does at 3.5%, and she pays a 3% co-bill. And to her, she's doing this uh, wonderful service for the community. Well, she did 10 or 12 deals in a year. It's so stupid, I can't even believe anyone wants to work on it. It's not, she can't make a living doing that. But it's no different if I say that when Homie goes, we're going to do this, we're charging nineteen fifty on the list side, and we'll pay a co-broke, and they've come up with some crap where they're going to put, like they're running for governor, or whatever the hell it was. That's some stupid creepless thing, because they don't have their phone ringing. Why would they behave like that? Because they weren't getting any calls to amount to anything. And they just, they don't have enough money, they don't have, there was a guy, years ago when I was doing, I don't know, maybe around 300 deals, and he, I was on KTAR, his name was Rick Black, he was West USA, he starts running an ad aimed right at me. If you list with him, you get him. And, and he's gonna do it at half the commission. So whatever I was charging, he, let's say if I was at six, he was gonna do four and a half, and pay a 3% commission. So he's doing one and a half percent. It's fantastic till he got up to about 90 deals. And guess what? He didn't have any money to hire any help, and him and his wife just couldn't fucking take it. So he drops down to about 40 deals and never came back up. Why? When people start using, I'll charge less, I can just tell you, they never come back from if that's their one way to get business, it, it, it's the only way they're ever going to have for the rest of what they're now going to be stupid career. It just is. And I'm not trying to tell you what to charge. I'm telling you, you, you charge whatever you charge. And I know I don't think my home group sets tells you what to, but you take, there's a number. You go, if it's below, then right, that's it. Well, what if they, they won't pay more? Then you're not doing business with them. It's real simple. And you go, what'd you do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. If you can't have some standard for what you're gonna do, then you, this isn't a business and it's no longer fun. Did I get your question answered? Anything else? Anything? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about Zillow. Oh, see, Zillow? Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know if you have anything that's good, you know, if we're sitting with someone in a listing presentation and they bring up their Zillow offer or mm -hmm. whatever, Say it again, louder. Uh, basically, what do you think is going to happen with them, like a class action lawsuit or anything? Because to do why? Why? Who's going to sue for what? They create this perception of value. Yeah. And they're selling homes now. Yeah. And don't you think that's like kind of a non arm's length transaction or some kind? Well, of let's first take up the lawsuit. There's no valid suit against them. They aren't breaking any law. Walmart creates the perception of value. Yeah. Costco is creating the perception of value. So what your protest is, and I agree with you, but it isn't some new thing with Zillow, it's open door. Open door and offer pad have successfully created the idea that they are the consumer's friend. Now it happens to be bullshit, but that's, they, they have successfully created that perception. Say it again? Brainwashing. Well, brainwashing, no. Uh, brainwashing implies that somebody was forced to do, like brainwashing, they were kept, uh, they were sleep deprived, they had pain administered to them, threats, and then they had some thought pumped in. No, it's successful marketing. And it has nothing to do with reality. 
like is but but let's talk about that let's use open door i can i, I can tell you uh, tons of facts so the first one is can open door continue like who's paying the most for houses right now zillow and open door period offer pad is not paying nearly as much is open door doing 500,000 plus homes yet 500,000 I, well in the past they wouldn't um take any homes over 500 oh 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 so price you're talking about price yeah I no no uh, uh, open door is not buying houses above five they don't even want to buy them above okay. four okay here but that's gotcha. let me stick to what's Sorry. more no it's okay I thought you were talking about some number of houses. I thought they're not anywhere near that. Uh, and if you want to see how many houses, you can just count how many they got. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, Russ, years ago when I first moved here in 98, and you was one of the first realtors that I heard, and I mm -hmm. thought it was genius. Because what you did was the same thing with OfferPad and everything else did. You made the consumer realize that, hey, if you don't like me, fire. Yeah. And that was the game changer because all my real estate friends, I wasn't even in real estate, they hated you for doing it. You tell them, they want to fuck with me. I hate them. I love fucking them. Okay, but I'm talking Dustin and I. But you know what, but here's the thing, and even when I when I first came here, he was doing something that no other really that wanted to do was get out of their comfort zone and right. do something different. Yeah, yeah. And look at you now. But then in those times, when, like I say, when I even contemplated to get into the game, again, everybody was furious. Who's this guy on the radio? How does he get on the radio? How's he able to market this? And no, how does he know? That was the big question. Yeah. Right? But now you're a genius now. That's the that's Now, the, this, this, this I was always a genius. No, <laughs> you <laughs> shut up. Listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> this man is the smartest guy. Oh, you are, I don't dislike you, but this guy, yeah. what you're saying is good stuff, right. and they all need to listen to you. <laughs> and I need to, to knock off that you are the smart one. Right. Well, no, and, and, and I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying, but as. But just as realtors in ourselves, you, you made it clear earlier <laughs> that being the first of doing, to do something. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you take this initial step to being the first to doing something, you're going to take heat. And are you yeah. able enough to stand up to yeah. this? You know what, let me just, if you know you're right and you, what you were doing then, you was consistently at it and you believed in what you were doing, regardless of what anybody had to do. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate and, that feedback. And I so, I mean, I've watched you for you. Like I said, I came here in 98. Nobody wasn't doing it. Nobody didn't have that. I was doing 60 deals a year back then. Yeah. And, and, and it was a lot of business to me at the time. So it just built up gradient little by little. But I want to take, there was a question here. Was here. The so, thing, so first of all, let me, let me use Open Door. Okay. Open Door recently got an additional, this is the word additional, 300 million in financing. The average profit that Open Door is currently making per house, after everything, this doesn't count their overhead, this is profit on the house, is approximately $1,700, as in less than $2,000. Wow. I want you to get that, and I want to talk about this, because this is really, this is like, so if, if somebody, are they paying more than the other investors? Yes. And Zillow's starting to match them. I'll talk about that, but I'm, I'm going to leave that there for a minute, but it won't take open door. So why are they doing it? They can't make a profit doing it. Right. It's the, the guy who started it and the people who own the company are trying to go public. And that $300 million, let me just finish this thought, that $300 million is the additional round of funding to get them to the IPO, wow. initial public offering. At which point, Eric Wu, the guy who started it, will be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, will they then, when they have stockholders that say, well, what, how much money are you making? Will they then need to actually show a profit? Yes, as a matter of fact, they will. And will they be able to pay the prices they're paying? No, as a matter of fact, they won't. And will then they then wind up sort of going out of business? Yes, as a matter of fact, they will. That's going to be a while before they go broke. 
It's not a sustainable business model, and it only works in a market that is a seller market, not a flat one or a buyer market. So do they have a rosy future? Not really. No. But are they here to stay from our perspective? Yes, they are. Now, they're paying more. Who are they putting out of business? Yeah. Other yeah. investors yeah. Mm -hmm. that would have bought the house and paid even less. So I could make the case that Open Door is actually doing a favor to the sellers who are inviting themselves to be taken advantage of. Like people would go, huh? I'd love to be screwed royally. Maybe, uh, that's, but seriously, that's, it, it's those people, because see, most people I, don't really hope they can take, get less for their house. But there are people that are so crazy, I can't have the house shown, we have dogs. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is I have this yeah, conversation mm -hmm. many times a week. We can't. We just mm -hmm. and so we tell them, okay, we'll get you an open door offer. We won't charge anything to represent you. Mm -hmm. We'll get you an offer with open door. Do we process? I mean, we're actually we funnel a lot of business to open door. They're not cheating anyone. And unlike OfferPad, <laughs> if you make a deal with open door, you change your mind and let you out of the deal. Oh. Now, the price they say they'll pay is a pretend price because they're going to come renegotiate after they see the house. But it's still more than any other investor is going to pay. And Zillow is apparently willing to lose some money themselves just to squeeze open door out of the market. Rich Barton, the founder of Zillow, actually said he can't let them get away with this. Oh, God. This is wow. so he is on the warpath. Well, let's let them kill each other. Uh, to <laughs> Squash them out because he doesn't want them getting all the good business. My apologies. No, no. So it, it's, they're going to all lose money on this stuff. Zillow can afford to lose hundreds of millions and never miss it, but it's the deal. Yeah. Does any of that, any of it, have a damn thing to do with whether you're going to have a great year? Yeah. No. None of it. You're going to have as good a year as you decide to have. Period. And you had a question. I forgot what it was, but I promised you I'd come back to it. I was saying with his 24-unit goal, uh -huh. and you talking about uh, not getting frustrated with it falling out of escrow, mm -hmm. <coughs> what's the mindset, your advice on the mindset, if, you don't. if he doesn't hit the 24 at the end of 12 months? To make sure to do more than that next year, set the goal higher, go for it. I mean, seriously. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Because let's let's take that real world and go. Okay, so here's let's say you got 23 deals or 22 deals. It's better than most agents are doing. Mm -hmm. So he's hardly going to go. Ah, oh, shit! I'm a big no. But it wasn't quite as much as he had in mind. So let's say that we set the target next year for 40. And you go. I only got 35. Yeah, that's fucked. But all right. <laughs> you understand? You just keep going. You, what do you, I mean, would there be some value in going, no, nope, you, you were a little shy of the goal. Uh, maybe if you couldn't find someone to give you shit for a few hours, maybe just give it to yourself. <laughs> and just keep doing it until you feel like crap. Then go, okay, all right. This will get me ready to go on that next appointment. <laughs> no, it happens. You, you, you go... Sometimes people set unrealistic targets for them. Like I, I've had people, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to someone who was doing 10 or 12 deals a year and they would set a target, they're gonna do 200. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd have, and it would be one of my seminars. And I'd go, you're gonna wanna set us a lower target. Why are you trying to make my target smaller? Because you're not gonna hit the 200. And you're kidding yourself to think you are. If you can't do 100, we don't need to talk about how you're going to do 200. Because you're not. The guy's just not going to happen. So I don't know of any advantage in giving someone a target so big that they're going to automatically fail. But sometimes he, I've done it to myself, so it's not like I don't have some experience in this. <laughs> but I don't know if you have any upside to it. But let's say you fail to hit it, then just set it again. Period. Just set it again. Because in the end, 
you go, do we judge? Are you trying to have a successful month or a great career? You understand? If you took the viewpoint, it's like we're getting near the end here. If you took the viewpoint that all of your behavior and your thought processes toward your customers and toward potential customers, but mostly toward yourself, this is what you're going to do for a living for the rest of your working life. This is it. There isn't something better coming. There isn't some fantastic other thing. This is it. This is what you do. How would you treat the business? You understand? How would you treat the business? So whether you do 22 deals or 28 deals, either way I'm going to go congratulations to you. Seriously. But I wouldn't let you settle. No matter what it did, I'd go, you do 40 the next year. Seriously, you can do 40. If you do 28, you do 40. You can, as a fact. But that's how you ratchet it up. But, but this is it. This is what you do. How would you treat the business? So you go back to those customers I talked about not working with. If you knew you were going to be fabulously successful, and this is what you were going to do, you'd go, I don't want to deal with customers like you. Don't. Don't do it. One time I was at a guy's <coughs> house, this is out in Mesa, this is years ago, and he was LDS, and his house had pictures of you know, Jesus and the church and Joseph Smith all, all over the house. And if you went in his front yard, this was near downtown Mesa, you could see the Mormon temple. He was a really nice man, really nice man. And he said to me, do you think I should take all these pictures down? I said, no. He said, do you think I should take some of them down? I said, no. He said, well, I've heard that people won't like it. I said, yeah, I've heard that too. My answer is still no. I said, you have a beautiful family. Anyone who doesn't like you is a shithead, basically. Because he was, he was like, kind of, I thought, how do you not like it? He, was, he couldn't have been nicer. And I said, who do you think wants to buy a house like this? Well, you can walk out and you can see the temple. My guess is somebody else who's LDS. That's just my best guess on that one. <laughs> and I don't think you need to take any of it down. I think they're going to go, I feel at home in this house. So you got what you have to sell. I mean, it's so, you are who you are. And you go, this is, like you're a good guy. And if you don't hit a target, do not beat yourself up. There's, there's, not, there's no upside to giving yourself some crap. Did I get your question answered? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Anything else? Anything? Yes, sir. Uh, what, what what drove you at that time when you were making those decisions, when you wanted to be separate, when you found a way to separate yourself? Separate myself. As okay. far as the My radio advertising, the, the heavy marketing you were doing, what drove you to that? What made you think, you know what, let me come up with this phrase. Number well, one. Those, those, all the phrases came later. So the, the, first, the, the first big thing, the first major defining moment, if you will. Yeah. I had been in real estate 12 years, living from closing to closing, deal to deal. I honestly had no idea how anyone wound up taking listings and properly pricing them. It seemed mysterious to me. I knew it could be done. I just didn't know how to do it. And I knew that all the successful agents I knew who were stably successful, stably successful, they were uniformly listers. They knew how to take listings, and they took listings. So I made up my mind, I'm going to be a lister. Period. That was the decision. I canceled my ad in Homes Illustrated, which is how I made my living. And Wendy goes, well, we don't have any listings. I know I have to go get some. That was my attitude. I'm a lister now. I, I don't. I don't want to talk to buyers ever. I don't want to work. I don't want to show them houses. Last time I had a buyer in my car was 1993. That's where I'm at. Yeah, in 1993. I'm not on any medications anymore. But I mean, this is really messing with me. Did I get your question answered? Yeah, the, the decision to be a listener. 
And does it take a bit? See, to work a biter, I made some jokes for you. If you don't smell bad, you have access to the MLS. Working buyers is primarily relationship-based selling. If you look around the industry, you'll occasionally see someone who seems like a bit of an asshole who's a lister. And you'll go, how is this possible when I don't even like them? They're not people pleasers, and you don't have to be a people pleaser to be a good lister. Period. I'm not recommending to be unlikable and disagreeable, but it's not a prerequisite. A buyer agent, you have to be likable or have an awfully good referral. Lister, you don't have to be that likable. You have to appear competent. <laughs> Get the difference. Mm -hmm. And so a listing presentation, like getting listings, is primarily presentation-based selling. There's a huge difference. So if a house was 300000 I'm just going to use some numbers here, and you were charging 6%, it would not be that effective a presentation to go, hi, I'd like you to write me a check for $18,000, hmm. and I will put a sign in your yard sign right here. You might not get the listing if that was your presentation. It's a little humor there, actually. <laughs> so you're going to want something better. So how do you get good at doing listing presentations? And the answer is, and I don't remember who I told was, go on it. Keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You have to get that stage time. And if you're not willing to knock on the door, you have stage fright with an audience of one. If you're not willing to go on a listing presentation and talk to them about why they should list with you, you have stage fright <coughs> with an audience of one or two people. How do you overcome it? By repeatedly going to the table. You just keep doing it. And if you don't keep doing it, what happens? You're a burnout. You'll wind up being stuck with buyers, and when you're 50, 60, 65 years old, schlepping some person who can't decide around the town, you're like, God, I hate this fucking business. <laughs> Seriously. Like, there are certain buyers that you think, oh, I, I love those people. Awesome. Like, people who, here's the thing. If I said, you want a cup of coffee? Yes, you want a cup of coffee? No. You want a cup of coffee? Oh, God. Oh. You know, it smells good, but the caffeine will make me jittery, and I don't think I know. God, I want it. Jesus, I want I kind of do want it. I don't want it. Now, let's change it from coffee. Do you want to buy a house? No. You want to buy a house? Yes. Either one works. You want to buy? No, I don't want one. So if they don't want a house, how long can it possibly take to sell them a house they're not going to buy? You understand? They don't want it. I don't want a house. If you said to me, would I like to buy a house? No, I live in one. I don't want rentals. Fuck you. Get away. I don't want it. It's real simple. Real simple. You want one? Yes. We've been transferred. We've got to live here. i got to find something today or tomorrow to buy. Awesome. There's your buyer. Now, how about the guy who says, well, if we found the right house, and it was a really, really, really good deal, we might then make an offer on it. And then of course, we'd want more than our house is ever going to be worth if we could buy the nice one. Now, yes, no, coffee, yes, no, maybe, in the mind, yes and no fused together is maybe. If you're dealing with indecisive people, you'll be on a maybe too on whether or not you want to be a realtor. If you were to go around asking, I would say the percent of realtors who, if you ask them to get past the social machinery, are you a realtor? Well, I mean, I don't want to come out and say yes. Um, I mean, you know, I do art and things. Uh, I have things I do. Why, why do you ask me the question? Yeah, if, if it's anything other than a yes, I am. Where's their head? You understand? Are you a realtor? Yes. Is this what you're going to be doing? Yes. Then you get rid of all the maybes. 
all the little stupid thoughts, the little shadow things of, well, I might be too old. I, you know, I, don't, I never finished uh, college. Uh, I don't know if I could do this. I never finished high school. And look what I've accomplished without even getting a GED, okay? That's a new one. So, okay, thank you. For those of you who weren't laughing, I don't know where that's going. <laughs> you owed me those laughs. Thank you. But seriously, you get rid of the you get rid of the maybes. At the at the bottom of every problem that doesn't resolve, there's always a maybe. That conflict. Do you totally see? Do you want? Do you totally want to close twenty four deals this year? Yeah, you took just a little bit, did you? <laughs> <laughs> you kind of fucked around a little bit, and you waited. You don't totally. There's some, you have some thoughts like, well, if, uh, you understand? I'm not <coughs> picking on you here. You're not, but you are. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. Is I'm illustrating a point for everyone. If you kind of have a, yeah, I, you know, I, if I wasn't in much trouble, I'd want the 24 deals. You know, I totally want the 24 deals. You have a conditional want, like I have. Well, if I don't have to work evenings, weekends, and it's not too hard, I don't get any rejection. <laughs> yeah, I, I could take the 24 deals then, but not if I have to talk to someone who doesn't want to do business with me. I don't want them that bad to keep going to overcome my fear of people. You understand? <laughs> there was a guy. There was a guy. I just can't help but remember this. And he had helped me so much. He was a pilot. And he was a computer whiz. His name's Gary Corbin. He lives out in Goodyear. The reason I'm telling you this, he was with Realty Executives, and he used to come to my house and help me when I was broke and help my, fix my computers for me when I didn't even have windows. I didn't have enough money to have a computer with windows or a mouse. And Gary would come over. And so I wanted to help Gary. And I said, you should, he was black, the reason I'm telling you this. And, and, and I, he said, I said, you should put your picture on your cards and in your ad. He had an ad in Holmes Illustrated. And he said, well, I don't know, some people might not like that. And I said, I promise you, Gary, when you show up at their door, they're gonna spot it. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, there's no way you're gonna miss that point. And whatever back off you have on trying to communicate to them, Get it right up front. I said, my guess is that you'd find there's black people who would go out of their way to do business with you, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And if someone's that prejudiced or nuts, you don't want them anyway. He listened to me. He went and talked to the guy who owned the Phoenix Suns. I can't remember his name. Uh, Glenn, Gary Calandro. And he said, Jerry, he, he goes and he gets an appointment with Jerry Calandro, and he tells Jerry Calandro, you're doing some of your black players a real disservice by not offering them a black realtor when they come to town to buy a house. It is good. It was fantastic. <laughs> he sold three players' houses that year. Wow. And he, he, instead of taking them going, oh, well, run with it. If you're young, for someone here who's young, tell them, because of my youth, I'll work hard to get your house sold. If you're older, because of my maturity. Take whatever the hell you've got, mm -hmm. run with it. If you're a single agent, explain to them the big advantage is you'll always, I'll be the one. Mm -hmm. If you have five people, the advantage is I have the five people. Whatever the hell you've got, that's what you're selling. Mm -hmm. Take every single thing about you. Again, every single thing about you and explain to them that's why they want to do business with you. You understand what I just said? One of the advantages, if you get women, honestly, is you know women are better negotiators. You just tell them that. <laughs> that they go, who's going to debate it? <laughs> it actually, in my opinion, is true anyway. So just agree with it. Because you don't have that testosterone, you're not going to give me the whole fuck. That's the truth. Women don't do that shit unless they're nuts. <laughs> but my point, you take whatever the hell you have and you tell them it's an advantage of doing business with you. 
and they, there's nothing to debate. So you go back, well, what about open? We're not, you're not competing with open door. You're competing with other realtors. You understand? Take the deal you have. I'm older, that's a huge advantage. When I was younger, it was an advantage then. You, whatever the hell, seriously. Don't hide you, it's the deal. And you tell them how lucky they are. I'm not kidding, it's a viewpoint. But when you embrace that viewpoint completely, you'll get business you never dreamt you were gonna get. It. Does that make sense? Yes. Now is there anything left? Or is this a good time to say thank you? Awesome. Thank you. There's no credit hours for this, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I was so pissed off, to be honest with you. And it, it, was, it was in the church. Uh, but I, was, I felt betrayed. Yeah, so I felt betrayed.